Uh, good morning, everyone. We're going to uh, start our next session here. Um, the next session is titled Devising the Best Practice in Developing an Effective Solar Regulatory Framework, a Comparative Overview from Southeast Asia. And our speaker today is uh, Techi Kapolan. Uh, Techi is a pioneer in the renewable energy in the Philippines. She joined Sud Edison in 2011 as country advisor. Um, and then in 2012, she found uh, Sun Asia Energy and is serving as its president, which has uh, 30 megawatts of projects in the pipeline. Uh, in 2013, she was named uh, Power Woman of the Year. So uh, let's all welcome Techi. Thank you, Bill, for that very generous introduction. Um, I will try uh, to do a comparison uh, of the uh, different regulatory regime, but my takeoff point will be the Philippines because uh, uh, this is where I'm uh, most familiar with in the practical sense because that's the, what the session called for. Um, and I've titled my uh, presentation as Doing Algebra Without Learning Math. That is really a puzzle because in the Philippines, and I'm going to walk you through it uh, uh, in my presentation, we really had to move at a speed of 300, even uh, our beginnings in solar as only a watt peak. Uh, the Philippines started with rural electrification, where um, uh, solar home systems were being installed in the remote areas, and from those beginnings, we had to move at 360 kilometers and build megawatt size power plants. So this is a presentation on how we did that, what the lessons were learned, and what are the policy environment that made that happen. So I'm gonna start by uh, giving you the solar story in the Philippines. And this is really what changed the game. This was when the Asian Development Bank demonstrated to the region and in the Philippines in particular that solar energy system works. So this is a 500 kilowatt on the rooftop of the Asian Development Bank headquarters in the east side of Metro Manila. And skip, skip the shading for those who are engineers here and very familiar with with how solar is set up. Uh, just try to have a blind eye on the shading aspect of this installation and just look at how the Asian Development Bank was trying to make a statement that solar works. And during their Clean Energy Forum in 2012, they asked all of the different government officials that attended the conference in the region to go up the roof and see how the solar system works. So this was really a game changer, both in the Philippines and in the region. In the Philippines, we moved ahead. And two years after, this was our great leap forward, and the Philippines became home to the biggest, biggest rooftop installation. This is a 40 megawatt in the southeastern side of Metro Manila in Cavite and the rooftops of an export processing zone located the solar panels totaling 40 megawatt. As we speak, this is still the biggest rooftop installation combined in the region. China is building double this. They're building about 160 rooftop, but that's going to be online at the end of the year. So we will still continue to hold this title until that time or until another one comes online. So this was our great leap forward. A bold developer and an EPC contractor con uh, made this happen in 2014. On the ground mounted side, another leap forward, 22 megawatt in the middle part of the Philippines in the Visayas. Before this, the single biggest solar installation in 2004 was one megawatt financed by the International Finance Corporation World Bank and owned and operated by Cagayan Electric 
Cagayan Electric and Power Corporation, Cepalco. This was the, Cepalco was the pioneer in utility scale. But till then, after 10 years, this was, this is now the holder of the title. Actually, I think months ago, I have to change my slide, and I just don't have a photo of it. Another one came online in Ormoc later. The end of 2014, this was the closer of 2014, the biggest commercial rooftop that a mall put up. This is a Schumart, uh, and this is 1.5 megawatt. So 2014 was a banner year for us, and that came about two years after 2012, when the uh, uh, Asian Development Bank introduced solar home system. This came about, and the policy driver that really pushed this was the Renewable Act of 2008. This was the time when it was signed. And in 2008, Thailand uh, didn't have a renewable energy law. Japan didn't have a renewable energy law. Malaysia didn't have a renewable energy law. The only countries, the, the countries that had the renewable energy law, which is very similar to us, were in Europe. And so our Renewable Energy Act was really copied and patterned after the Europe. Thus, the feed-in tariff. So this was followed by the installation target. This was the first batch, and we call them FIT-1, which is the first batch of the FIT. And then in July, uh, the feed-in tariff for the different technologies were put in place. And thus began the really megawatt uh, construction in the Philippines. Mind you, by this time in July of 2013, Thailand had already one gigawatt of installation target. Malaysia had about already ha had, had already several uh, megawatt of rooftop. The program of Malaysia is rooftop. The program of Thailand is ground mounted, one gigawatt of solar PV and one gigawatt of uh, solar thermal. And so these were the three countries that in Southeast Asia that had a renewable energy targets already and feed-in tariff at this time that when we passed our feed-in tariff. Japan was not yet in place. So most of the component manufacturers, most of the developers, most of the financing community were being located in Thailand because one gigawatt is a pretty big size as an installation target to fill. So it was only a year after that the rules, the payment rules was crafted. So although there were project developers who were already starting to look at the Philippines as a site for project development, this, uh, the payment uh, scheme or the payment rules weren't set up yet. So it took one year before the payment rules were uh, put in place. So you can understand why most of the construction happened in 2014. By this time, the basic pillars of the feed-in tariff program were already in place. How do you calculate the fit allowance? The fit allowance was only enacted the first quarter of 2015. This was after two plants were already online and they were already billing billing the fund administrator uh, because they've already completed their construction. So what is the present landscape? Um, if you look at 2014, the total approved service contract was already at one gigawatt. In 2015, it increased by 30%. This is 1.3, and this is in the first quarter of 2015. The approved commerciality, certificate of commerciality, meaning ready to build, uh, from uh, 85 in 2014, this increase doubled. It's already about 200, more than doubled, 297 to date. And project constructed in 2014 from a 62 megawatt, it went up to 106. This is the present landscape in the Philippines right now. It's still a far cry from Thailand. Thailand is about one gigawatt, and they've increased their target to five gigawatt. Um, uh, 
we are better off than Malaysia. I think Malaysia has not moved forward in terms of their feed-in tariff. But by this time, Japan is already online and um, has approximately four gigawatt of installation target because of the Fukushima incident. So in Asia, um, uh, Japan would be one, the, Japan would still be first in installation target, Thailand will be second, and we're a far third in terms of the installation target. So what is going to happen moving forward? I think everybody knows that the Philippines have been earning very good credit rating because of our growth rate, and this has been consistent in the last three years. We expect that it will continue to grow, and therefore with growth comes increased consumption of energy more appliances, more, air, more cooling systems, more malls, more business enterprises. And therefore, that will definitely increase the demand of um, uh, energy. The aspiration of the Department of Energy in one of the policy statements of the energy planning unit in the Department of Energy was to maintain the existing generation mix. And as everybody knows about 40% of that would be renewable. From that 40%, we will have to carve out our space, the solar space, the wind space, the biomass space, and the hydro space. So I think the next three years will be exciting years, and therefore the Philippines will continue to enjoy that place in the regional community. Now this is what is expected. Everybody is asking, do you think it's going to be filled, the 500 installation target? This is based on industry intelligence. We may be, it's maybe not accurate, but this is industry intelligence. So we expect that this is not gonna be filled. And essentially in the bilateral, this is the, uh, that this is the other, this is the other um, um, projection. And one of my partners are here. So his, uh, his project is also listed in this, uh, in this table and these are, as I said, these are only, these are basically um, applications within ERC and known bilateral agreements. So the total by 2015 will be something like over 500, some bilateral and some fit. So what are the challenges? First is the land. This is the most difficult challenge in the solar space in the Philippines. And one major contributor to this difficulty is really our land reform law. We are not allowed to own more than seven hectares. And for you to consolidate a big size of property, you have to go through a very tedious and long process. So the conversion process of land will remain as the defining point in the installation of solar. The Department of Energy has entered into a memorandum of agreement with the Department of Agrarian Reform and uh, introduced an administrative um, innovation by classifying applications for conversion and giving solar a priority status. Okay, It cuts the application process, but only by two months. But it's still long. Okay. So that needs to be reformed. Certain introduction needs to be done, like maybe parallel application, filing of application, because you have to go through sequential and that takes time. So that's one, and I call this the four L. Second L is location. Given the difficulty in land consolidation, you have to choose your land, you have to choose your site. There are better sites and there are best sites in the Philippines. And I think most of the developers are familiar with that. There is one reason why everybody is in Negros. The irradiation is good. Unfortunately, the grid is weak. But in Luzon, there are very good sites that have very good radiation. And I think every, all developers should look at that. Third are your local partners. It's very difficult for your technical and funding partner to navigate through the bureaucratic maze in this country. And it helps for a local developer to do that, but finding one is going to be a challenge for you. There are good consultants and good developers and good contractors. So really it's up to you to kind of rate them. And the last is legislation. You, we have to work as an industry to make sure that our regulators appreciate how solar, the value of solar in terms of tariff are concerned. 
the main strategic challenge will be transmission. So we have to shift from our uh, engineering focus uh, to uh, installation to transmission. We've got to have more dialogue with NGCP, more dialogue with, uh, with Meralco, and more dialogue with distribution utility companies to be able to address this issue. So our industry agenda, uh, so that we can match the growth of solar in Japan and in Thailand, will really be streamlining the land conversion, revising the build purpose policy. There are funding partners that haven't really quite understood you know, appreciated why the build first policy in the Philippines is something. The major effect of this is really raising the interest rates because of the risk that a build first policy offers. And the last is more transparent permitting pro procedure. We don't really know who will build. We will only know this in September when everybody will construct because that is to our assessment, that is the last month for you to build your power plant to reach the March 2015 deadline. There has to be more transparency to reduce the risk, meaning to say Department of Energy has to compel project developers to submit, to submit their achievements every so often so that the website of the DOE can be a guide to funding partners who are willing to put their money into the Philippines and invest in solar. So I think, um, the Philippines is now earning itself a place in the sun. Um, we are expected to uh, be a darling of the funding community, and we will try to live up with that expectation. The industry, the Philippine Solar Power Alliance, will partner with the different developers and continue to be a dialogue partner so that we can have a more conducive place in the Philippines for solar. So thank you, and good morning to everyone.